This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. To give some context, this video starts out, um, I'm coming after another service technician. I had another service technician go out, he changed a compressor, it was kind of a late evening service call, and I had to follow up and come back out and change a dual pressure control and fix a refrigerant leak. So I'm gonna go ahead and get onto it. Interesting one, I'm working on a walking cooler repair and the power goes out to the whole area. Um, I've been waiting for about, 45 minutes and it's been taking so long that I actually sent a service technician to go get me my portable generator because all that I have left to do is vacuum the system down and charge it which I know how much this system takes 14 pounds so I was just going to do it with the generator and the, uh, the recovery machine and pump the refrigerant in but again my guy hasn't showed up yet but then all of a sudden I hear power restore or what I think is power restore because the equipment starts buzzing, but it wasn't right. And I ran over to that AC right there and checked power and everything's single phase and they only reset two legs of power. So I ran downstairs, shut down all their three phase breakers and uh, let them know. But this entire complex of this restaurant right here is single phasing right now. You gotta watch this stuff. This is why I tell people whenever there's power outages to go turn off all the three phase breakers and, tell, and just leave a couple breakers on single phase ones and wait for everything lighting wise to restore, you know, as a customer before they check or before they completely turn everything on, especially if it's like a planned power outage or something. This one's a, uh, luckily I was here, you know, it, you know, sometimes the three phase equipment will recover from that, but if it's, uh, if it's motors that are already on their way out and stuff like that, they can, uh, they can burn up, you know, so. Anyways, my guy's still coming with the generator, so we'll see if they have power properly restored by then or not. Check this out. One leg to ground has 80 volts. Another has 122. And another leg has 40 volts. So it's not even single phasing. They haven't restored. There's a weird power problem going on. This sucks, man. Again, luckily I was here. They're going to have, uh, I mean, yeah, who knows? This whole complex, though, you know, other restaurants are going to have this problem, too. Honda generator for the win. No problem starting up that vacuum pump either uh, because the vacuum pump, it's the field piece VP85. It has that uh, soft start feature on the DC motor. So super, super awesome. It's like a slow ramp up. All right, well, we're gonna let this thing evacuate and then if we have to, we'll, we'll push the gas in with the recovery machine too. All right, we still don't have proper power. Um, it's still all jacked up. So I pulled a vacuum. Um, the decay came to 1061. This thing's a piece of junk. I'm not worried about it. So we're going to leave it at that. So what I've done is I recover or I vacuumed down. I've still ball valved off and I have this closed right here. Okay. So, um, I'm going to purge my gauges real quick. So what we're going to do is we're going to pump the refrigerant in backwards. So the inlet is coming from the tank going into the machine and the outlet is going into the hoses and we're gonna pump all the refrigerant into the receiver. Uh, we know that the system takes about 14 pounds of gas. That's gonna have to be good for now until we can come down and pump it down. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start this process, but first I have to purge to this hose right here. So we're gonna go ahead and turn this guy on, okay? And then we're set to recover, we're set to here. Go ahead and turn this guy on and I should be able to purge right here. Okay. So now we're purged and the other hoses are still in a vacuum at this point. So the next thing we're gonna do is go ahead and front seat the king valve on the receiver. By front seating it, the refrigerant's gonna flow into that port right there and it's not gonna come out going downstairs. So we're gonna front seat it, put as much into the condenser and receiver. Well, we're gonna put 14 pounds in and we've got the scale right here. So we'll get that started. All right, I'm gonna finish front seating this king valve right here, nice and tight. Um, these caps, these valves always leak on the packing, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, slap that on there just finger tight. So now we're ready to turn this guy on. Now, keep in mind, um, running off of a generator isn't the best thing because uh, sometimes the inrush of these things can be a problem. But again, on this field piece pump, because it has the soft start, uh, the, it has a very low inrush and uh, we shouldn't have to worry about anything with that. So we're open here. Our scale is zeroed out. We're good here. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I think, let's see, we've got gas going all the way to here. 
so that's a good sign uh, yeah we're ready to turn it on so we're gonna go ahead and uh, open up the high side all the way and then go ahead and uh, making sure I'm not messing anything up nope I'm not open this guy up it's already taken a little bit of refrigerant we're gonna go ahead and turn it on we also got to make sure that we don't flood too much liquid into the machine. You got to listen because if it over, you can thro uh, throttle it, I guess I should say, if too much liquid starts running through. So we're going to let this process happen. Uh, I believe there's nine or 10 pounds in this tank and then we'll have to put a little bit more. This is R22. So, all right, uh, this couldn't have been running for more than a minute and a half, two minutes, and we're already at 11 pounds, three ounces. Um, so we're just about maxed on what's in here. You can see my tank pressure is at seven PSI right now. So we're gonna go ahead and pull that down. Also, being that we're using the MR45, it actually will have the auto shut off. So theoretically, it could just let it keep running, but we won't. We'll go ahead and do that, and then we'll add the extra refrigerant here in just a minute. Everything's a little bit off because we do have a little bit of gas trapped in the hoses and stuff, but we think we're looking for about two pounds right now. And again, it'd be easier if we could turn the system on, but because there's no power, we can't. So we're having to do with what we have. So we're gonna go ahead, we hooked up this guy. Um, we're gonna zero out the scale. Uh, I already purged it up to here, so we're good to go on that. I'm going to open this guy, and then I'm going to go ahead and open this guy, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, pump in until the scale reads two pounds. We'll probably go just a hair past that just to compensate for any gas. Luckily, this machine also has a self-purge, so you're able to get most of the trapped gas out of it. Um, everything's ready. Turn back on. We're good to go. We're going to go ahead and turn this on. See the soft ramp up. Also got to throttle it because we are pumping liquid just to make it go faster so so you see how fast it's pumping we're pumping super fast so we're gonna go for about two and a half pounds that's an estimation oops my bad I throttled my thing there you go but uh, I actually throttled here like I would normally with refrigerant but you can't do that because that's theoretically the discharge so okay so we're about two pounds, eight ounces. That's about all that we're gonna put in the system right now with no power. Again, we're doing all this because they have no power. So we're running everything off the generator. Um, we're gonna tell the customer how to restore power. I have all their breakers turned off right now so that nothing would burn up and they'll just have to turn them on later and we'll probably do a follow-up visit. The kicker is, is it's Christmas Eve Eve. It's December 23rd right now and I really don't wanna to have to work tomorrow. So we're trying to do this. Hopefully you get power restored in an hour or two, I hope, or something. Um, we'll also, that condenser looks a little dirty, so we'll blow it out with my air blower. It's funny how that works. Power just turned on when I finished with the repair. But that's cool, so at least I can see everything operate now. Um, at this point, we're ready to turn on power and open up the king valve. We should turn this on, nothing should happen. Because the pressure control. Um, yeah, so we're just going to open this guy up start this up and make sure it comes down in temp we're gonna back seat the king valve should turn on here in just a second positive pressure you can go ahead and pull the Schrader core removal I mean the uh, vacuum gauge off there we go it's running I need to finish doing this I still have the Schrader removed from this guy right here. Sight glass is clear. We're gonna give it a little while to run. It's kind of high in temp, so. Okay, now that I completed that, we're gonna fast forward to, once we had to change that compressor, we actually brought to the customer's attention that the equipment was in horrible shape, okay? We had to get it operating by changing the compressor, but we inevitably talked them into replacing all the equipment too, okay? So we're gonna go into that equipment replacement right now. Today, we're getting started on a walk-in cooler replacement. We've got existing equipment. We're gonna start running the line set today and penetrating down inside the box. Um, it's gonna work out pretty cool, actually, so. All right, the new coil, the refrigeration lines are in different spots, so that's how I were able to leave the existing one hooked up. We drilled a new hole, so that way the P-trap can come down, go over, and then go into the coil, which will be this way. So we're gonna go do that hole over there now 
And then uh, we got a decent little area. It's a little cramped as far as the height goes, but we can get up in here. It's nice. All right, we have uh, this one now drilled too. So that's perfect. And we're gonna just start getting some copper up here and all the other good stuff. Whenever you drill these holes, like right now, someone just went in the walk-in box and it used this as a pressure relief. So all the crap comes flying up. So you always wanna be careful working in the attics after you've drilled a new penetration, it'll blow that polyurethane foam up into your eyeballs. All right, got a crap ton of insulation and a crap ton of pipe. And we're gonna lay it out, uh, get an idea where everything's gonna be. Now, this is because this is a dual evaporator, um, we did the calculations and we're coming down with seven eighths for proper velocity and you know oil return back to the compressor. But uh, once we get to the second coil, we're gonna reduce down to five eighths. It's actually gonna come out of a T and go five eighths to each coil, but we're gonna run five eighths from that coil over to here because there's no sense in running seven eighths. All right, so we're working with hard drawn ACR today and uh, we just annealed it, got a nice clean bend out of it. So it's nice when you have room up here to work. Nice clean bend, swaged it right there. And we're just going up. So we're just sliding the insulation on and working our way back. We'll do the liquid line next. Just like I've been doing for everything else, we're annealing the end and then I just swaged it with the swage bit on the drill. Nice and clean, good. Raise it on. We've been flowing with nitrogen too, so this is just my drop down into the walk-in coil. We reduced down to 5 eighths, and then this is the main run to the condensing unit. That's the run to the other coil, so we're going 5 eighths to both coils. All right, we are just about done. We got to go up onto the roof now, and we're going to use soft copper and put it down here and then make some braze joints right in here. But we still got to support the lines, but as far as everything goes, the line sets ran. It's going right there, it drops down, and then over at the other end, right over there, it drops down too, so we have one solid line set. So we just gotta support, and then the day of the job, we gotta come up here, cut the old line set out, and foam the holes and stuff, but so far so good, and we were able to do it with all hard drawn, and just anneal it, so no um, you know, normal brazed in elbows or anything, so that was cool. So this is my existing equipment walk-in freezer. This is the one that we're changing walk-in cooler. So this is the top side of what we were looking at earlier. You can see my lines right there. So what we're gonna do is just cut this out with the sawzall right here, this little section. And then uh, we'll break this conduit free and we'll use that right now. And we'll just kind of bend the lines over and leave them right there. We're not gonna do this job for another week or so, but uh, I wanted to be 100% done with the line set. So. We're gonna knock this out right now. This is all that we're gonna do today. We've just got the line set up here. Now, it looks like crap right now, but when we do the job, we're gonna eliminate this line set, and we'll be able to straighten everything out and make it, you know, neat a little bit more, I guess I should say. Um, so we still have to braze in the attic so we don't have those pinched off yet or capped. So we'll pinch them off and tape them when we're done. But we gotta go down there, cut, braze, and then uh, 
then we'll be done for today. All right, final two connections right here. Then we'll tape it up. I got my guy downstairs turning on the nitrogen. We have the nitrogen flowing from all the way down, way over there in the box, all the way up here to the roof. So I had pulled the insulation down with a tubing cutter and pulled the insulation up with a tubing cutter. So then I brazed it on and I let the tubing cutters go and they perfectly met. Just gave them a tape, taped the liquid line to it, and that's it. Again, we're just uh, support a few things and we're off to the races. All right, my crane is getting set up. Uh, what I did was pump the unit down, all the gas into the receiver, shove my service gauges into the unit. We'll have a tech recover it on the ground. We got the unit disconnected, the electrical disconnected right there. Line set, cut, condensed unit unbolted, so the crane's gonna lift up the new unit. We'll take down the old unit. You gotta watch out for the vaults right there. So you gotta make sure you set the crane up accordingly where it's not gonna collapse a vault. So uh, you can see the reason why we're changing that coil. It's just completely disintegrated and it's vibrating to all hell. It's been a bunch of leak repairs up in here. It's been a nightmare. So it is time for sure. So it wasn't gonna work. It was gonna be too weird with the uh, original wood. So I very carefully cut the wood in place without going through the roof. Just kind of notched it and then broke it off. We're gonna move some things around. Now, this isn't gonna be perfect because eventually we'll change that walk-in freezer, but the conduits were secured to those four by fours. I'm not gonna be able to make that look perfect because I'm not gonna replace all that conduit. So that conduit's probably gonna look like crap temporarily until we change that condensing unit. Um, but yeah, we're moving along. To make life easy, the condensing unit's gonna set back a couple inches from where it used to sit. And I'm gonna go ahead and do these bends or try to do some of these bends now. So I'm gonna pitch it down towards the unit and then do a bend into the unit before I set the unit there. So that way it's easier to work and I don't have to fight the unit, you know, and all the equipment in it. We're gonna take these two valves and get an approximate measure from center to center. So we're gonna go with about three and a half inches. And then uh, I've already got the suction line bent where I need it. So we'll make this bend three and a half inches further than the suction line. So hopefully it'll line right up. That's the plan at least. And then I gotta figure out a way to cross it over and make it look good. That turned out nice. Nice good pitch. Kinda acts as a trap too, or reverse trap or whatever. Um, cool, I like it. We're gonna braze these guys in. The last thing I need to do before I finalize this and braze this is I need to hinge that exhaust fan to make sure that it's not gonna hit when it hinges. Um, we, I was just thinking about that right now. I don't want the grease cleaners to come drop it on the condensing unit kind of a thing. All right, nope, we're safe, we're good. It has chains holding it up. And that's not grease, by the way, that's just water from the rain. Um, you know, it's not ideal having this this close to this exhaust fan, but I'm not gonna really reinvent the wheel here. Uh, so this is what it is. And it'll be fine. This isn't a grease hood, by the way. They don't even cook anything under this hood anymore because they've redesigned their kitchen. So it really does a whole lot of nothing. All right, got these two done. Braze turned out nice. Valves are nice and protected. Um, all right, we are going to, uh, I'm gonna have someone start on the electrical on the roof and I'm gonna go downstairs and Hopefully the guys have the coils hung and I can start uh, brazing the suction line and liquid line in down there. So I'm gonna go ahead and let this go because it's being held back with the tubing cutter. It'll slide right over. And then uh, we'll keep the nitrogen on, but I'll just turn it off at the valve right now. And then when I'm ready to braze down there, I'll have my guy up here turn it on. Okay, we're doing a nitrogen pressure test right now. Um, the, uh, get up to about 150 PSI and see if it holds. Um, yeah, everything's doing good, but look at that, that discharge temperature controller clamp thing is on the ground. We'll have to make sure we get that put back on. Hopefully the clamp's not missing. All right, I'm confident in my welds. You can see I'm in pressure test mode or tightness test mode on the field piece manifold. So we've been running for approximately three minutes. I've lost 0.1 PSI. The pressures aren't changing. I actually didn't lose 0.1, I gained 0.1. Um, I'm confident we don't have any leaks, so we're gonna go ahead and get the vacuum rig set up and pull the evacuation. Now this is a pre-charged unit, so the refrigerant is sitting behind this valve. I can actually, the whole time we've been working, I can see the refrigerant moving around in the sight glass. So all we're doing is evacuating the line set and the evaporator coils. We're gonna go ahead and start with a one hose evacuation. If I find that it's not keeping up, then I'll put on the second hose, but I don't think I'm gonna need to because it's just the line set and the coils. So we're pulling through the suction side, and we have the core or Schrader core removal tool on this guy and the micron gauge on the little process stub on that. So we're getting a true vacuum reading all the way through to the liquid line. 
Um, I'm gonna start putting panels on and wrapping things up just to try to make use of my time while I'm just waiting up here. I run the gas ballast open until I get below 1500 microns or so. You can see we're at about 930. So, oh, you probably can't see that, but yeah, we're at about 900 microns right now, true vacuum. So we're gonna go ahead and close the gas ballast. And uh, again, we're gonna get it down to probably, I'd say about 400 microns is what I'm aiming for. Um, and we'll do a decay test and go from there, but it's kicking ass just on one hose. When you're not pulling through oil and stuff like that, it pulls down super quick. We also got to get started on removing the old line set from the attic. We're going to yank it all out, go cut it up, and then I'll put the lid on. And yeah, that's it. Like I said, this electrical right here is going to have to look crappy. When we change that condensed unit, which I'm sure will come soon, we'll clean it all up and make it look pretty. But I can't really do a whole lot about it right now. I'm going to start the decay test. When you work with these things, you want to slowly close them, let it run for a minute, then close them again because there could be a little air pocket in there. Uh, we're at about... I don't know if you guys can see that 242 microns right now so we're gonna go ahead and uh, start the decay test I'm not gonna I can do the timer on on uh, the blue vac app if I wanted to but essentially I just don't want to see it rise too fast so uh, we got to let the vacuum catch up with itself first because you see how it's still dropping right now even though I've got it valved off because it's still making its way through the system so we're gonna let it sit there for a few minutes make sure within five minutes it doesn't come above a thousand microns and I'll be pretty comfortable with that. Ideally, you want to see it like if you're if you're pulling down to 400, you probably, I don't know, maybe don't want to see it come above 800 microns or something like that. So, all right, it's been about five minutes. We're at 185 microns, and we're not even we're still dropping. So, I'm confident we're good on our evacuation. Um, we're gonna go ahead and open the system up, let the refrigerant through and turn on the condensing unit. I'm gonna go ahead and start the system up with my normal gauges. So I'm actually, before I opened up anything, we're still in a vacuum. I'm just vacuuming down my hoses all the way up to the vacuum core removal tool, all the way in my manifold and everything. So that way we don't contaminate the system, you know, with air in my hoses or anything like that. And, you know, I try to do that when I can because I have the tools up here. I might as well just run the quarter inch hose, pull it on the manifold set and then we'll open it up to the system pressures and all that. We're started up and only one fan motor's running, so I would assume that one of those controls right there is a fan cycle control. Um, I'm trying to think if I've ever seen them stage where they do one, which is the best way to do it, but really they should have two fan cycle controls, one for each motor. Um, but we'll see. We're at about 223 PSI right now, 448A, so let's give it a minute and see if it kicks the other fan on. I, I turned it, made sure it wasn't locked up or anything, so. And there we go, it kicked in. So I think we're doing good. So they are cycling only one fan, which again, in a perfect world, it would be better if they had two cycle switches so they could cycle them both at different pressures. But they don't do flooded uh, head pressure control valves on these things. So this is their only means of uh, head pressure control is just fan cycling. Back uh, the next morning, I wanted to come to a follow up and check evaporator superheat. Um, see my control is satisfied therefore my evaporator fan motors are spinning slow on both coils uh, that's normal for these new high efficiency systems and as it turns on you can see the fan motors speed up so you're going to start to see that more and more with the new awef walk-in requirements so all right everything is looking good we're monitoring everything from on the roof i'm going to go ahead and pull up the system vitals on a screen record right now and show you guys what measure quick was showing me one thing i will say is we've got one condenser fan motor that is cycling on head pressure so it's got a fan cycling switch on it so that is going to affect our sub cooling readings and the overall system vitals so keep that in mind when i pull up this screen share right now so to see the multiple superheats what we do is hit the little snowflake icon in the front go down here to multiple superheat test and then we can assign the different probes. So I know it's the top two probes or temperature clamps. So you can see on one evaporator, I'm running 11 degrees. One evaporator, I'm running 12 degrees. So I like that. That looks good to me. Again, we're aiming for about 10 degrees, but I'm not too overly concerned with that. All right, real quick before my system satisfies. We're looking good right there. The sub cooling's a little bit high, but the condenser fan motor just turned on the second stage. Um, so it's still kind of stabilizing out, but my box is literally about to satisfy right now at 34.9 degrees. 
Let's go ahead and see what my evaporator superheats are. We're looking at 11 and 12, so that's still doing really good. Don't see any problems here. Condenser TD is dropping as the condenser fan motor uh, since it turned on, so. There we go. That's a more realistic sub cooling for sure. Okay, so you can see the system's kind of operating pretty good. I mean, you know, because that condenser fan motor is cycling like it is, it's kind of skewing a few of the numbers, but it's okay. Overall, our system is doing good. It's maintaining proper temperatures. Um, you can see that these new condensing units and evaporators that meet the new AWEF requirements, um, they run a lot more efficient as far as energy efficiency, and that's the whole goal of the AWEF requirements, okay? It's really important to, uh, to know what it is that they're doing here and why they're doing it, because we're really trying to save energy. If we can reduce the energy consumption, then we can save the customer money and or relieve the stress on our power grid too. Now, there's some problems because of it. You know, I'm not taking a political stance either way, but I mean, this is what we have to deal with. Some interesting things that I take away from these new AWEF compliant condensing units and evaporators. One thing is measurable subcooling, okay? That's a trip because normally on a refrigeration system, you would not have very much measurable subcooling when you have a receiver. But this one, as you guys see, I mean, I have pretty darn good subcooling. Currently, right now, with one condenser fan motor off, we're running a little high, 19 degrees subcooling. Um, but uh, when that condenser fan motor cycles, I'll typically see anywhere from 8 to 10 degrees subcooling on the liquid line going downstairs to the evaporators, okay? So uh, that's pretty cool. So what they're doing on this system is they're simply taking the, the liquid refrigerant coming out of the condenser, okay? It goes into the receiver, then it comes out of the receiver, goes back into the condenser, does another pass through the condenser, then comes out, goes through the liquid line filter dryer, through the sight glass, then down. So you get that extra added subcooling circuit to try to maintain efficiency. Um, if we can uh, lower the condensing temp, but still maintain proper subcooling and still keep a clear sight glass, then obviously uh, we can operate on a more efficient system. So overall, it's a decent install. Like I mentioned, you know, I'm not really going to do much about those refrigeration lines right now for the walk-in freezer because we will be changing that equipment very soon. But the walk-in cooler looks nice and good. Um, I would have loved to have set it back from that exhaust fan, but again, it's not a grease or even a heat bearing exhaust fan. It's not even being used anymore. My customer buys their own equipment. It's not my favorite brand of equipment. It's RDI. I mean, but it's functional. It gets the job done. It's just not pretty, you know? Um, they don't do a very good job tying up the wires and, you know, just little things like that. And uh, I don't really care for those little peanut pressure controls that they use, the little encapsulated ones. But hey, again, the equipment's functional and it operates and it's what the customer wants, okay? So essentially, we're coming out and we're installing the equipment for them, but I had to you know, let them know like, hey, we really need to consider replacing this line set for a couple reasons, okay? Number one, the line set was really deteriorated. When you pulled back the insulation, it was already turning green and it was really pitted out. So inevitably, it was going to leak eventually, okay? But on top of that, because we changed over to R448A, um, the refrigerant lines were way too big, okay, and we needed to reduce them down to maintain proper system efficiency, okay, for oil return, refrigerant velocity. So the suction line of the ex the original equipment was uh, inch and an eighth, and then it ran to the first coil, and then it dropped down to seven eighths to each coil, okay. And the liquid line was uh, half inch the entire way, all the way to both coils. Uh, with R448A, I did the calculations using the uh, Sporlins Virtual Engineer, and we calculated uh, because, and let me let me preface this by saying too, we also downsized the equipment because what was there was uh, oversized. I think they had a three and a half ton or a three ton uh, condensing unit with two 14,000 BTU evaporators, I think, if I remember right. And what we actually, when we did the load calculations, being very generous with our load calculation, we actually went in with a two and a half horsepower condensing unit and two 9,000 BTU evaporator coils, okay? And that was much more closer to what the actual uh, heat infiltration and load calculation told us we should have, okay? With that being said, because the equipment 
went down in size and also because of the R448A refrigerant, we had to adjust the line sizes, okay? So um, that's what the, you know, we really needed to adjust that. And if we didn't, we potentially were gonna have too big of a liquid line, which would make the system take more refrigerant than it potentially needs, which could also lead to our receiver not being big enough to hold and or pump down the entire charge into the condensing unit. So that's something you gotta think about. And then the suction line being too big can mess with your uh, refrigerant velocity and your oil return coming back, okay? Um, certainly, you know, as I'm editing the video and even while I was doing the job, I realized, you know, I probably should have put a P-trap on the riser going up to the equipment, um, but that was marginal whether or not I needed it, okay? I had P-traps on both evaporators and we had a reverse trap on the, you know, coming up on top of the walk-in box. You know, so yeah, it's kind of, you know, should I have put a P-trap going up to the equipment? I guess maybe. Um, it kind of would have led to uh, having to redo a few things, but it could have been done, you know. Certainly, it's really easy when I'm done with these jobs to watch the video and watch the footage and be like, oh yeah, you know, I could have done that and that probably would have been better. But hey, um, it's there, it's functional. I really don't see us having any problems. That, that rise from the walk-in box where it goes up onto the roof is probably five feet. I really can't see that being a problem. But in theory, the, the potential of an oil issue is what we are trying to prevent by putting those uh, P-traps, okay? So, um, you know, we could theoretically have oil get trapped on top of the walk-in and maybe we wouldn't have the velocity to push that oil back up. But again, because I size those lines accordingly, I really don't see us having those problems, okay? Um, if you wanna know where to get that information from, uh, you know, you can open up any uh, refrigeration um, installation book. They'll often have line sizing charts in there. You can open up the old Copeland manuals. I've got them over here, the blue paperback manuals. Just look up Copeland refrigeration manuals. Um, you can open up your, uh, your refrigeration textbooks that you had in trade school. Uh, also go to, um, uh, Sporland's website, sporland.com and, uh, look for their virtual engineer. And on the virtual engineer, you can actually do uh, line sizing on there too. So essentially, uh, once you do your load calculation, once you, um, size the evaporators, then you size your condensing unit to, you know, uh, have enough, um, uh, to be able to uh, run the evaporators. I was tripping over my words right there. Once you come up with your condensing unit and your evaporators, then you're going to go ahead and come up with your line sizes for the refrigeration lines, figure out where you need P-traps and all that good stuff, okay? So there's lots of great information. All you guys got to do is research it. So check out Sporlin's website. Look for Sporlin Virtual Engineer. You can even just Google Sporlin Virtual Engineer, and I'm sure it'll come up too, okay? Um, but yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. I know the video kind of started out with that you know, uh, service call right after I came and changed the compressor. So the time span between those two, uh, sections of the video from when you saw me using the generator to charge the system to using, uh, to doing the installation, I would say was about three months. Um, I kind of knew it was coming. So I was just waiting on that footage. Uh, as far as the generator goes, you know, um, I've actually never ran into that problem before. That was something interesting, and I'm glad I had that small portable generator, or we would have just been at the mercy of the power company. Um, I had actually just bought that little portable generator from my own house, and uh, you know, probably a couple weeks prior to that, because we've been having a lot of uh, wind events out here with the Santa Ana winds that we get in Southern California, and they've been shutting our power off because of it. So I went and bought that generator, and I'm thankful that I did because, you know, um, it it worked out really well to be able to do this, and uh, you know charging the system with the recovery machine. That was interesting too. I'd never done it before. I mean, it's nothing really crazy. If you think about it, you're pulling the refrigerant out of a system. Why can't you push the refrigerant into the system? Um, I like pushing it into the receiver though, like I did, especially with that King valve front seated. So then, you know, it's just going into that receiver. Um, that makes it very nice. And something that I mentioned in the video that I could have done that I didn't do was since I was pumping that refrigerant into the receiver and the King valve was front seated, I could have uh, used a heat producing device and heated up the receiver and checked the liquid level from the get go. Um, I actually did it after I started the system up after the power was restored and checked it. But I could have done that because essentially we had a pump down system, you know, once I got that full charge in there. So 
anyways, I really, really appreciate you guys making it to the end. Um, you know, uh, the end of these videos, you know, they may get a little bit longer and longer, but I'm really trying to answer all the questions that people ask me and I can kind of predict the questions that people are going to ask me. So, um, if you haven't already check out the HVACR tools, YouTube channel, there'll be a link in the show notes of this video. Uh, remember I do live streams Monday evening at 5 PM Pacific on my YouTube channel, uh, work permitting, of course. And then I also go live on the HVAC overtime YouTube channel on Friday evenings with my buddies just to kind of hang out and relax and talk about the week. So hopefully we'll see you guys on one of those, uh, live streams or on another video. Okay. Really appreciate you. And, uh, we will catch you on the next one.